about X-ray absorption spectroscopy uh, for chemistry. And the following week, we're going to have uh, Daniele DeSantis from ESRF, who is going to speak about macromolecular crystallography at, uh, at EBS. So, and uh, today, today we have uh, Marine Cott, uh, who is a scientist at ESRF. She's going to speak about uh, cultural heritage studies at the ESRF. But first, uh, just a couple of practical uh, details. So, in the end of the presentation, you will be able to, 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 to ask questions. But uh, even during the presentation, uh, you can already ask them. And to do this, you have to use the question and answers box in, uh, at the bottom of the uh, Zoom uh, window. And, uh, but before asking, please uh, have a look. Maybe the questions that you want to ask, uh, someone else has already asked it. So in such case, uh, it would be great if you could uh, vote or like this question. And then uh, in the end, uh, we will not have repeated questions, but we have a clear vision of which questions are more popular. So we will ask them first. So uh, coming to to our uh, seminar of today. As I said, our pleasure today is to welcome Marine Cott, uh, who's a scientist at the uh, ID of Human Beamline. So she obtained her PhD at the uh, Center of Research and Restoration of French Museums. She worked on lead-based cosmetics and pharmaceutical compounds used in antiquity. Then she made a postdoc in ESRF, where she has enlarged the application of uh, micro X-ray and FTIR spectroscopies to ancient paintings, glasses, and plastics. And now she has a twofold position. She is a director of research at the CNRS, uh, uh, Laboratoire d'Archéologie Moléculaire et Structurelle, Structurale, uh, in Paris. And uh, she's a beamline scientist uh, at the ESRF. Uh, she's in charge of uh, ID21 beamline, a beamline dedicated to X ray microspectroscopy with various applications in the field of uh, cultural heritage, biology, and uh, environmental sciences. So Marine, uh, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Kirill. So welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for, for being connected today. So indeed, I will talk about cultural heritage at the SRF. And my talk will target both expert and non-expert people. So I will start with an introduction for non-expert people to explain you why and how we are analyzing uh, ancient materials and in particular why we use synchrotron techniques for that. And for expert people, there will be a second part or for anyone in need, uh, more about uh, the new capabilities offered by the new source and by the new instruments, the new beamlines which are being constructed and implemented at the SRF. So as you can see here, 20 years ago, the cultural heritage community was rather marginal. There were some experiments, but only from time to time. Uh, however, we observed a, progress, a progressive increase of such activities uh, over the last 15 years. And in particular, in 2005, there were two important events. So there was the organization of the so-called SR2A uh, conference in Grenoble, co-organized with Institut NEL. Already we have a technical problem, I think. I, I, okay, I think I cannot progress on my PowerPoint, very unfortunately. I hope the program will, pro problem will be solved soon. Okay, now it works. So there was, as I was saying, the organization of the SR2A conference in Grenoble with Institut Niel, and also in 2005, sorry, the creation of a dedicated review committee EC for environmental and cultural heritage matters. So since then, these activities in the field of cultural heritage progressed well, and the community is now well identified and still growing. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, I have, seems like my computer does not like so much YouTube. Anyway, so as a clue of this increasing interest, I would like to mention the cultural and natural heritage workshop, which was organized this year in January, and which attracted more than 150 persons, two thirds of them who were not previous ESRF users and who are potential new users for, for the future. What I would like to underline is that most of the talks which were given during this workshop, they were recorded and they are available on the YouTube ESRF channel. So when I prepared my talk, 
I took some examples and some discussions which were uh, presented during this workshop. And I will invite you in, in some cases to have a look to some particular videos to get more details. So these videos, you can find them in this playlist, Cultural and Natural Heritage. So as an introduction, what are the main objectives of synchrotron analysis for ancient materials? I would distinguish two uh, types of objects, non-manufactured objects, where the key question is evolution on life, of life, and this at different time scales, from days, months, years, centuries, millennia, up to million or billion years. And you see that the questions are completely different. For example, embryonic, uh, embryonic development, growth from child to adult, species domestication, or life evolution in general. And there is a huge activity in this field, in particular in paleontology, and I will give uh, a few words about, uh, about BM18 and paleontology activity at the end of this talk. My talk will focus more on manufactured objects, which are completely uh, different type of objects and also which are, receive completely different questions. Here, the, the key objectives are to understand processes both during and after creation. So questions of evolution of technologies, intentions of the artist, of craftsmen, questions of authentication and conservation. But I will give you more uh, details about that. So uh, when we talk about cultural heritage, probably you have in mind artistic culture, like painting, glasses, sculptures, and so on. But you should not omit that there are other objects, other materials which are constituting our cultural heritage, any materials which contain information about past knowledge past scientific and technical uh, culture. For example, how textiles were um, obtained, dyed, how ink and writing were invented, what were uh, medical or pharmaceutical practices in the antiquity and so on. So to answer these questions, we can find information in the text, in historical text, uh, like in manuscript, or sometimes we even have patents, uh, but it can also be very relevant to analyze directly the objects because they may contain a kind of memory about the way they were produced. So again, when we analyze objects, there are two main complementary approaches. One way is to analyze directly the object itself, either bringing the object to a lab or here as in on this picture to a synchrotron facility, here it was in Daisy. Uh, uh, or to when, when the objects cannot be moved, to bring portable instruments directly to the museum or archaeological site or, or wherever. And uh, it, we, with these kind of, of techniques, we will try to get as many pieces of information as possible. However, in some cases, uh, having the possibility to analyze fragments is, is highly rewarded. So this is not something we do specifically, and it has to be well uh, motivated, and in particular, when we want to get chemical information at the micrometric scale. Uh, and for those of you who are not in this field, it may seem surprising that we, are, we take fragments from the painting, from, from the objects or the, the paintings in this case. So I wanted just to show you a few pictures so that for the non-expert, you can get a better idea of what it means in practice. So here, this is a patch of grass by, by uh, Vincent van Gogh, and one sample was taken, but as you can see here, it is in, in a part which was already degraded. And so in other conditions, we could have, for example, get samples from the, the side which is, uh, side which is uh, hidden by, by the frame of the painting. And these samples are extremely small. This one is particularly big. I would say it's one millimeter, but typically samples are less than 100 microns. So the idea when we have samples is that they are as small as possible and they are sampling them will not affect the object integrity. Now, from the scientific point of view, which are the, the main questions. So as I was saying in the introduction, there are questions that are targeting the past of the object and the future of the object. So for example, we would like to know which were the components which were used, if they were natural or synthetic, what were their geographical provenance, how they have been associated, what was the formulation in order to obtain the artwork, and what was were the, the later evolution like degradation. So in terms of chemical uh, words, it can be translated into what were the reactants, what were the physical or chemical processes involved in the production of the artworks, and have there been other reactions, uh, slow or fast reactions, which have affected the object and led to the formation of secondary or, or ternary uh, products. So a key question is usually where 
ends the artist's intention and starts degradation. And in parallel, there are many questions about uh, authentication. Who was the person who associated the components in order to obtain the artwork? And to answer these questions, chemistry can be very useful. So to give you some example, I decided to talk about pigments and paintings because they are, these are the most uh, common materials we analyze uh, with synchrotron, I think. And uh, here you have a graph which shows the evolution of, of pigments through the edges. So there are some pigments which have been used from prehistory and until now, and other pigments which are much more recent. Most of these pigments, they are based on metals. And by determining the metal composition, you can get a clue about the pigment uh, itself. And this can be useful, for example, to follow historical evolution of pigments. Some, some pigments that were used in a very short period and also for purposes of uh, dating, authentication, and so on. So of course, uh, techniques such as electron uh, scanning, electron microscopy, X-ray fluorescence, will be very useful to assess this elemental composition. But with the examples I will show just after, what I would like to highlight is that if we can go further than just the elemental composition, there is much more information that we can get about the grades, the quality, the conservation state of paintings and pigments and artistic materials in general. So to take an example, I will talk about lead white. Lead white, as you see, has been used uh, since the antiquity and until modern time where less toxic alternatives have been proposed. So here you have a sketch of the way lead white was traditionally, traditionally synthesized. So it's based on the corrosion of metallic lead. So you, have, you see uh, jars, and there were rows of jars containing lead plaques suspending above vinegar, which were stuck, and, uh, stuck under a horse manner. And this is the name stack process. And the decomposition of the manure produced CO2 and heat, and the combination of those reactants with acid acetic vapors induced the formation of lead carbonates at the surface of lead. And then the pigment was scratched away from the me metallic lead and the, it was collected and sold uh, to painters like this. However, when I say lead white, I should better say lead whites because it's not a unique composition. And that's something we, very, which is very interesting. And indeed we have a clue that they were uh, there are different qualities of lead white. This is a manuscript by Leonardo da Vinci, which is an order. And it was proposed that these two lines here, they refer to an order of two different qualities of lead whites with two different prices. So we have already uh, the impression that uh, Leonardo was selecting different qualities of lead whites. After that, the next question is, can we make, can we distinguish these different lead whites? In, in, in the pigments, in synthetic pigments or pure pigments, but above all, also in historical paintings. So a few words about the chemistry of lead white. Here you see how the lead white is produced from the corrosion of metallic uh, lead. There is a formation of acetate, and then which turns into plombonacrite, hydrocerizite, and cerizite. And the final powder will be a mixture of cerizite and hydrocerizite. However, after the corrosion step and before it is sold to uh, painters, there are a couple of post-synthesis processes which can completely modify the composition, and in particular, the ratio cerizite hydrocerizite. So an important question for, for colleagues, in particular, Victor Gonzalez, who was leading this project is, can we get a structural signature of these lead white grades and quality? So to answer these questions, Victor went to the beamline ID22 where he used high angular resolution X-ray diffraction. So you have here a picture of the beamline. The X-ray beam is arriving like this. And here uh, you have a small piece of painting, a lead white uh, painting, which is mounted in the capillary and the capillary is rotated in the beam such that uh, we have production of X-ray diffraction. And with this detector, we can measure the diffraction at different angles. So this is a typical X-ray diffraction pattern, which provides lots of uh, information. So uh, it will allow immediately to identify that cerizite and hydrocerizite are present. But more than that, thanks to the area of the diffraction peak, we can get some quantification. Thanks to the width of the peaks, we can get information about the crystallite sizes. 
And thanks to the asymmetry, we can get information about stacking faults. All these parameters will, will tell us about the way lead, op, lead white was obtained. So by reproducing in laboratory the synthesis of lead white, Victor showed that from the original produ product, which is obtained after the stack process, uh, the ratio hydrocerizite to the sum hydrocerizite and cerizite, as well as the crystallite dimensions were completely modified, for example, by levigation, heating in water, or washing in acidic conditions, for example, using vinegar. Having obtained this uh, characterization or this calibration, if you want, uh, Victor analyzed fragments of lead white paintings from a huge corpus of uh, fragments from uh, paintings preserved and exhibited at the Louvre Museum. What is interesting to see, for example, here is that uh, in the different paintings by Leonardo da Vinci, the different uh, grades or composition of lead white were used. This one, this one, and that one. Even more interesting, in Saint Anne, in two different fragments, two different qualities of lead whites were obtained. And this can be uh, explained if you look at uh, one fragment from the sky as a cross section. Indeed, a sample which was taken in the blue layer was showing a, a composition which is quite unusual with a high amount of cerisite and pretty small crystallite, while the sample which was taken from the ground was showing a more regular uh, ratio hydrocerisite to cerisite and much bigger crystallite. In such cases where we have a multi-layer and a complex heterogeneous sample, it's even uh, more interesting to use another technique, which is high lateral resolution micro X-ray diffraction mapping. So the, the principle of this technique is to define a 2D map over a cross section and to acquire X-ray diffraction patterns at every pixel of this map. This way, not only you can identify phases, but also you can locate them. And this technique is available at several beam lines. So now, if you want what, to know what were the results of uh, this kind of analysis, why Leonardo used a different lead white quality with a high amount of cerisite in the blue sky. If you want to see another example in particular with uh, revealing the secret composition of Rembrandt's impasto, I invite you to have a look to Victor's uh, talk which was given during the, during the workshop. From a chemical point of view and also an artist point of view, there is a period in history which is really interesting. This is this industrialization and contemporary period where suddenly on the market, there were many new materials, many new pigments, but also many new materials like polymers, materials based on uh, petrochemistry, which will revolutionize not only paintings, but we can also think about photography, cinema, and so on. So, suddenly the, the artists, they had available new materials and they made full use of these new materials. And again, we have this uh, complexity of a single name of a pigment does not correspond to a unique composition. A clue of that is given by uh, Vincent van Gogh. So in this letter that he sent to his brother, Theo, he asked his brother to buy a couple of pigments, a couple of paintings, and notably he mentions uh, jaune de chrome, chrome yellows, and three types of chrome yellows, the lemon one, number two, and number three. So showing again that behind a single name, chrome yellow, we can have many colors and many compositions. Even more interesting, in the letters, in the letters that he sends a few days after this one, so on the 11th of April, so apparently he received this order, and he makes a comment which is very interesting. He notes and he underlines that all the colors that impressionism has made fashionable are unstable. All the more reason boldly to use them too raw, time will only soften them too much. So these, these uh, painters such as Vincent van Gogh, they, they had the possibility to use completely new materials, but they knew already that some of them were unstable. And that's a domain where synchrotron techniques are, are regularly used to understand pigment degradation. So here I uh, extracted a couple of examples to show you the diversity of pigments. So we, we had users interested in understanding pigment degradation on Prussian blue, chrome yellow, cadmium yellow, or other more traditional pigments, such as smalt, copper resinate, mercury sulfide, arsenic sulfide. And behind all these cases, there, there is a, somehow a, a common trend. So the, the, it can be sketched like this. You have a paint which composition can be pretty complex with both pigment, binders, but also sizer or any kind of additional components. 
And in some cases, this paint may be unstable. Usually, but not systematically, uh, the degradation will be superficial. It may appear obvious if you see the painting in front of you, but if you look at a cross section, this alteration layer can be extremely thin, something like a few microns. And it will be important to understand what factors, both in terms of paint composition and in terms of external conditions like light, humidity, temperature, and pollutants are playing a role in this uh, degradation. So here you see typical uh, questions that uh, users or researchers uh, aim at addressing. To identify pigment composition, which are usually metal-based pigments, to identify degradation products, which can be both crystallized and amorphous, and to get this identification both in self and degraded regions, it's even better if we can have both of them together doing the same analysis, and to assess the effects of the paint composition and external conditions on, on this degradation phenomena. And for all these reasons, uh, there has been a huge su success of micro X-ray absorption spectroscopy techniques to answer these questions. So I will briefly show one uh, very, uh, I mean, relevant example. Uh, it's a research which has been done by Letizia Monico from Perugia uh, over, I think now almost 10 years. Uh, and she, Letizia, she is interested in understanding degrad pig pigment degradation, and in this particular case, chrome yellow degradation. Uh, and uh, together or in parallel to another group in Lisbon, uh, both of them have been interested to make a link between the name, the composition, the color. So you see lemon is a lead chromate partially substituted by sulfate, but also to link this composition with instability. And by preparing model paint uh, samples and by making an artificial edging, it is obvious that some of these paints, they are stable, while others are, are very, very sensitive to the UV and visible light, and they change, and they, they tend to go to a green-brown color. By using extra absorption spectroscopy as a chromium KH, we could see that from the original chromate, which is uh, the constitutive of the original pigment, upon degradation, there is the formation of, uh -huh, if my computer, OK progresses, sorry, uh, there is a formation of chromium-3 uh, species. So there is a reduction of chromate uh, into chromium-3, which is affecting the color. So in summary, uh, the, the higher the sulfate proportion, the higher the solubility, and the high uh, and, and the light sensitivity. What is uh, nice with chromium K edge is that you have this very, very good contrast because chromium three, between chromium three and chromium six, which can be exploited to perform some 2D uh, chemical map of, of the, this kind of uh, species. So in particular, if we set the X-ray energy either here to this position, which is a pre-edge peak, or to this position, here we will overexcite chromate, so chromium six, and here we will uh, excite any type of, of chrome compounds. And this has been used to study a couple of uh, fragments from historical paintings, in particular this one, which was taken from the table in the sunflowers, which are exhibited at the uh, Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And Letizia revealed that, very unfortunately, the yellow here is not the original yellow, and there has been a very thin superficial degradation. And thanks to her model paints, she can get an idea of the original color when Van Gogh painted the sunflowers. Um, from a technical point of view, so this, this technique, micro X-ray absorption spectroscopy, is uh, as uh, demonstrated to be very useful. My computer is slowing down. I hope I will reach the end of this presentation. It's not sure. OK, let's give it a few seconds to refresh. Suspense. Okay, you missed. Okay, so from a technical point of view, um, we have a method which is offering characterization and location of degraded chromium. However, as you can see on this image, the we are just at the limit of the the lateral resolution. So these pixels, they have they are something like 0.5 microns. If we could have had a smaller beam, we could have obtained a much better visualization. Of, of this degradation layer. And second, this image is based on the dual energy map. So uh, the same map acquired at two energies. 
So it's a bit qualitative. It would have been better to acquire the same map at tens or hundred maps to get a more quantitative and better spectral characterization. So again, if you want to know more about Canyon yellow, chrome yellow, or Prussian wood degradation, or to know about 2D Xens method, uh, Letizia gave uh, an extended talk during the workshop, and there is a video on YouTube. Also during the workshop, there was a specific uh, session about heritage and EBS. And this is also the core of uh, this series of seminars. So I will spend a few minutes to talk about that. But again, I will go very briefly. So if you want to get more details about all the things I'm going to talk about, I really invite you to have a look to the videos. So let's start with EBS itself. What does that mean, EBS? It's an extremely brilliant source. It's the name of the new source which has been constructed over last year and that we are now commissioning and starting to use. So the concept, the concept of uh, this EBS, it's based on ultra low emittance storage ring. So as you can see here, so in practical terms, the low emittance of the electron source translates into a small photon source and a less diverging beam that you can see here. Uh, the result is a jump in brightness by at least two orders of magnitude, together with a significant increase of coherent fraction of, of the photon beams, which is represented here in green. So in, pract in practical terms, what does that mean for users? So higher bright brilliance, higher coherence, will tra translate into faster experiments, higher throughput, larger corpus, larger fields of view, better resolution, possibly also better sensitivity. However, we should also mention the fact that with more photons, there is a higher risk of radiation damage. And this is something we have to consider and to assess and to control. What I want to uh, highlight is that there is not only a new source, but there is also many, many efforts in developing new beamlines, new instruments, new techniques. And I, I would like to thank all, all colleagues who are involved in these different instrumental developments, which are making a wonderful work so that we, we, have, we can propose, we can offer to users the best uh, state-of-the-art instruments. So in the coming slides, I selected uh, a couple of uh, techniques that I think can be useful for the community of cultural heritage in three domains, diffraction, imaging, and spectroscopy. So let's start with diffraction. The first example, the, the first uh, proposal is uh, presented by Catherine de Joie on ID22. So I already mentioned the high angular resolution setup, which was used for lead white. Here it's a kind of modification where the idea would be to combine high angular resolution with in-depth resolution. And this is sketched here. So the, the concept is to set an analyzer crystal together with a 2D detector to a, a certain a specific uh, Bragg angle such that depending on the in-depth position of a crystal which would diffract at this angle, this in-depth position is directly imaged by this 2D detector. So behind that, Catherine, she has in mind applications for paintings or manuscripts, and it will be a way to image non-invasively the, the position, the in-depth position of some pigments, for example. Uh, second, uh, a technique, which I already mentioned a few slides ago, it's a high speed micro X ray diffraction mapping. So, I already explained the, the principle of micro X ray diffraction mapping. What I would like to make the focus on is a question of speed. Here you have a huge map, a huge, I think it's very, I mean, it's, I think it's the biggest, uh, the thickest cross section uh, of a paint I ever analyzed. The map itself is something like two millimeters times 3.6 millimeters with a dwell time of one second per pixel, this map would have taken one month, which was clearly not feasible. When we acquired this map, we used, we had a dwell time of five milliseconds per pixel, and the map was obtained in four hours, which was really already impressive. But Manfred Bogamer at ID13, thanks to the new source and to, to development of new detectors, he expect to reach dwell time as low as 0.2 milliseconds it would mean that this map would be feasible, would be uh, obtained in only 10 minutes. And this is really a revolution. It means that in, in one day or even less than that, we could uh, analyze tens of samples. So it completely uh, invites us to rethink the way we have access to synchrotron facilities and to this kind of uh, experiments where we could think about grouping users who have a similar ex uh, technical need to make the experiment more efficient and more beneficial. A third technique which is based on diffraction, diffraction that I wanted to uh, highlight is X-ray tychography. 
So it's not completely new. It has been developed over the last 10 years. And it's a kind of combination between coherent diffraction imaging and raster scanning X-ray microscopy. Uh, it offers the combination of high resolution, so sometimes of nanometers, together with quantitative 3D picture of the sample, the possibility to analyze large samples or large, we are, I think, in the, in the millimetric range, and it's well adapted to non-crystalline samples. Also, something to note is that more and more people are exploring several contrasts, in particular, spectral tychography and drag tychography. So until now, I think there has been no, uh, no experiment using tychography which have been published, but this is something which is under development. And I, I think that the cultural heritage community can also take the advantage of this kind of techniques to go really in, uh, in full depth and in, to, to study materials at the nanometric level. Uh, talking about imaging, if I can go to the next slide. No. Alors, next slide. Okay. Okay, next slide. Um, there are many beamlines which are offering different imaging capabilities. I will not go into details. I wanted to highlight one particular beamline, a new beamline, BIM18, because it will be extremely promising for the cultural and natural heritage community. So a few words about BIM18. It's a completely new beamline, specifically designed for the study and the imaging of large objects with multi-resolution imaging. So the design is such that it's a very long beamline, fully designed to ensure highest possible coherence, smallest possible source. Uh, so offering a very large beam, a beam of uh, 30 centimeter uh, di dimension width, uh, a huge long experimental edge, 45 meters, meaning 38 meters of propagation distance for phase contrast imaging, and also a very large energy range up to 350 kV. Um, the, the philosophy of this beamline will be to offer imaging, but the possibility to switch from low resolution to high resolution in an efficient way. A key aspect is the sample stage, because uh, for the study of the samples which are planned to be studied, like as you see on this uh, image, uh, mummy sarcophage or huge skulls, huge fossils, it was very important to have the possibility, the mechanical possibility to accommodate big, heavy, and very large samples. You, you can see here uh, technical details about the, the maximum size of samples that which could be accommodated. And also uh, effort have been made such that going from low resolution to high resolution will be, uh, will be uh, made uh, efficient. So any, if you would like to get any information, you can contact Poltafon. And last, let's talk about spectroscopy. So first, ID21, the beamline for which I am responsible. So I already showed you this uh, example with uh, chemical maps of chromium, chromium-6 and chromium-3. We are now uh, designing a new a second microscope, and which will be indeed a nanoscope, which will have uh, several uh, improvements with respect to the present microscope, in particular in terms of beam size. So this represents the pixel as it is now, which is just sub-millimetric and which was used to obtain this map. And this is how it should be in the future with new focusing optics. So we will really go to the something like 100 nanometers. Also, we are working on the improvement of the X-ray fluorescence uh, detection system. And we hope to be much faster, typically down to five milliseconds per pixel, meaning that we could obtain this map with much better resolution or, or and, uh, and uh, at many energies, not only on not uh, two, two energies, but to go from multispectral to real hyperspectral uh, approach. So I am quite convinced that there will be many applications in the field of cultural heritage with this new nanoscope. Another complex of beamlines I wanted to highlight is uh, ID24, BM23, and in particular two techniques which have not been used so much until now by the for the study of artistic materials, but I think they can be beneficial. The one on the left is based on dispersive exhausts. So this dispersive setup is very useful when you want to collect uh, xas or xanes or exhausts in a very short time, typically here in the millisecond range. So either because you want to analyze uh, dynamic systems, but in our case, it can be because we want to have large field of view, 2D maps, or even tomography, uh, hyperspectral tomography. And this is something which should be considered. 
On the right, you have uh, an image of a high resolution X-ray fluorescence detection system. So, and which can be used for X-ray fluorescence, but even more interestingly to do X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And uh, um, this exists already, for example, on ID26. Whereas what is interesting here is that these techniques will be combined together with the possibility to have a micro beam. So for the analysis of heterogeneous samples, like artistic samples, I think it will be very interesting. And finally, I also wanted to uh, highlight uh, another approach, which is uh, developed on ID20. And there were some uh, first uh, experiments by colleagues from Ipanema uh, reporting applications to the study of fossils. Here, the idea of, of X-ray Raman spectroscopy is to get information about low Z elements, such as carbon, but still using hard X-ray uh, as, as an excitation, meaning that uh, it combines the the advantages of hard X-ray, like the penetration, the possibility to go in depth and to study uh, thick uh, volumes, together with the sensitivity to light the elements. As a conclusion, what I wanted to say is that um, what we are, what I presented now, is the fact that with the new beam lines and the new source, we will have a, a better, let's say. Uh, way to produce data from samples. But there are steps upstream and downstream that we should also take into account. So if we are more efficient in data collection, it means that we can probably welcome more users, new users, and more diverse users. But this needs to reconsider and to implement new access models. For example, as I was mentioning, grouped access as done in protein, protein crystallography, or possibly remote access as we are going to experience in a couple of weeks. And it means also uh, giving information, trainings, and so on. Regarding the samples, uh, so if we are more efficient, we can study more samples, larger field of view, so get a better representativeness. But it also requires some efforts, in particular in terms of sample management, sample preparation, and again, sample preservation. And I, I, uh, again, we have to, to take into account and to assess and to limit the risk of radiation damage. So then we can produce more data of better quality and but also of higher complexity. So together with these upstream developments, we also we are also making efforts in the developments of tools, software tools for a better ma data management and metadata management, data processing, data analysis. And you are all aware also of this uh, open access trends, which I think can be very, very beneficial for the community. So ultimately, the idea of all this effort is to produce more results of better quality and accessible to more people, not only those who are collecting this data, but uh, to, to as many people as possible. And by chance, yes, the ESRF is supported by Europe in all these tasks, thanks to the so-called Streamline project, which is funded by Europe. And so I wanted to thank Europe for uh, supporting the ESRF and in particular this webinar. And I wanted to thank all the users whose work has been uh, mentioned or who are also working in this field. And I could not uh, give them a chance to be uh, illustrated today. And all colleagues from all services who are supporting these activities. And I'm ready for questions, Kirill, if there are questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Marie, for this uh, wonderful presentation. We are ready for questions. I would remind you that to ask questions, you can use the question and answers box in the bottom of your Zoom window. And uh, uh, the first question is from uh, Davide Comboni. And uh, well, actually it was asked before you covered it in your presentation. So the question is whether some uh, minerals uses pigments uh, can change their colors if they react over time with water present in the atmosphere. So I would probably generalize it in a way that uh, what, what are the main causes of changes of color? Because you showed that the, the, the pigments can change color, but what, what are the generally the, the main causes? So why it happens? So if I go back here, here you have the main, uh, you have the main phenomena which are responsible for color, color change. In the case of chromielos, which I presented, the main factors were the composition so it was clear that depending on the composition, some samples were stable. For example, the lead chromate is pretty stable. However, uh, the more you substitute chromate by sulfate, the more sensitive it becomes to, uh, to uh, degradation. In the case of chromielo, uh, the main reason for degradation is light. 
and we have observed that uh, and some specific uh, wavelengths are, are more aggressive let's say towards towards degradation in other cases for example uh, i think it was one month ago we reported the study of uh, cadmium yellow in the screen and in this case light is not so much the key parameter meaning that uh, one sample kept in the dark could also degrade in this case it was due to humidity so there is not a unique degrad uh, explanation and a unique answer to your question it's really it really depends and it's even more than that it's not only the pigment it, it will also be the way the pigment is used if it is mixed with another pigment you may have reactions of one pigment with another the binder can have also an, an effect so there it's a multi parameter uh, problem okay thank you very much well, another question is about the samples because uh, I guess the samples uh, that, that you have sometimes they can be pretty precious. And so Patrick Bruno is asking, uh, what is the procedure to obtain artifacts from uh, museums? Um, so what 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 do you do to get these precious samples? So uh, let's say we at DSRF we are not in charge of sampling. Uh, fragments, but this is typically done by conservators or curators, and their users are usually in contact directly with uh, with museum uh, colleagues to discuss and to explain why they need fragments. In some cases, the fr these fragments have been taken a while ago. For example, the, the illustration I gave about lead whites and these many, if I can go back to this huge uh, collection of, where was it? it was there. Here, you see here all these samples that were already existing. They were sampled may, maybe in the 70s, in the 80s, usually during campaigns of uh, conservation studies, uh, uh, cons conservation, um, and and so when when samples are taken, they are preserved and they are conserved in databases. So in in this particular case, no additional sampling was done. It was just to reanalyze an historical database. But this is again, this is more the responsibility of users more than the SRF. So it's a long discussion. And so, so there are some, uh, let's say, colleagues from the museum who are really supportive and who, um, who understand the value of this micro analysis and who are, who are pushing also, also because they, they have to take care of the integrity of the, of the objects who are more who prefer to have uh, to develop uh, the approach of uh, with portable instruments directly onto the object so yeah, it depends okay the next question is about from uh, Gosia Corbus um, and the question is about uh, the radiation damage this uh, the questions that often pops up uh, in synchrotron science yeah so can you comment on possible ways of uh, minimizing radiation damage for heritage? Yeah. I think the strategy will depend about which damage we talk about. If we talk the damage which affects the data and how reliable are the data, or the damage with respect to the sample itself. For example, like uh, if, if the, a white pigment becomes black after analysis, this is not something you, you want to have. So there, there are different approaches, like the development of new techniques, like the improvement from, from the det detector uh, efficiency and so on. One uh, direction that we are uh, assessing with, that we have been working on uh, the few months before the shutdown was to limit radiation damage. So the effect on the data itself to work at low temperature. So this was for the study of, um, of chrome yellows. So for, for this kind of samples, we have compared the Xen spectra obtained by uh, acquiring this spectra at room temperature and in cryo conditions. Cryo preservation is something which is quite uh, systematic when analyzing uh, biological samples and uh, which is not so frequent in the field of cultural heritage. However, we have observed with Letitia that uh, we are clearly, clearly reducing the speed of radiation damage using low temperature. So it, this is, of course, not something that you are going to apply to an entire object. But uh, for the study of fragments, this is something we, we can indeed consider as something possible. So this is one of the strategies that we are evaluating for future analysis. 
Okay. And probably another another thing that uh, helps uh, in dealing with the radiation damage is increase the sensitivity. And, uh, so Marco Roman asks uh, whether you expect an improvement in uh, sensitivity for XRF at uh, ID21 uh, with uh, the coming upgrades. Exactly. Yes, we. So I did not uh, detail that, but indeed. Uh, for example, at ID21, the, the full, uh, let's say, design of the microscope has been uh, rethought. In particular, we will uh, make the geometry such that we could, could collect X-ray fluorescence from both sides, while now we are, we are collecting only from one side. And we are also, also aiming at getting much larger detector such that we can collect as many photons as possible, so to be much more efficient. And also with the idea that uh, if we can reduce the dose, if we can, then we can reduce then the risk of radiation damage and be more efficient uh, on the collection point of view. So this is something we are considering, and I other beam lines go in the same direction of a more efficient detection. Okay, and then coming back to the factors that may damage the, the paintings, for example, other art objects. Uh, Luis Carlos uh, is interested whether the uh, microbial growth can be relevant for this kind of damage, uh, in particular, perhaps sulfur compounds involved. Is it, uh, is it a problem? Is it relevant? I don't see exactly how. Uh, so I, microbe, I... Can microbes degrade, uh, cause a degradation of, uh, of pigments? Ah, you, okay, okay. I, I was thinking yes, I, I think this is uh, on, on my, microbes. So, no, yeah, no, 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 it's not, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, this can, yes, yes, yes. In many, many cases, we have indeed a degradation which is due to any, uh, let's say, a biological system in general. Yeah, it's not, yeah, yeah. yeah it was not listed in my slide, but it can also happen. Yeah, there is another question from Mustafa Seba, who is uh, apparently interested in uh, the historical uh, buildings and the studies of degradation of historical buildings. So he's, ask, uh, he's asking to recommend a beamline whether, where such studies, uh, in particular the studies of uh, deformations with high resolution, can be possible. If you can recommend uh, a beamline for this. Uh, yeah, uh, for the study of uh, materials. So clearly, I mean, if, if the question is the structure, the porosity, uh, the observation of cracks and so on. We have all the imaging techniques which are very well uh, suited for this kind of characterization and which are regularly used for the study of, let's say, modern uh, materials. And we, they are so efficient now that it is also possible to have a dynamic follow-up of, uh, of materials like uh, cracking which are forming, like uh, diffusion of some uh, fluids in uh, porous systems and so on. So yeah, there are plenty of beamlines. I could mention uh, ID19, the future BM18. If, we, if they want to go in more details, uh, ID16A and B. Uh, from the chemical point of view, very recently, and it's also a work which was done by uh, Letizia, uh, she, she was looking at the chemistry of limestones and in particular, the conservation of limestones. And there, there is a manuscript which has been recently submitted about that where we, we, we use spectroscopy to characterize uh, the efficiency, if you want, of uh, conservation treatments for limestones. So the two approaches are possible, the chemistry or imaging or both of them. Okay. So uh, what, what, what you showed is this field is uh, highly multidisciplinary. And uh, it's, I guess we are, we are all convinced that the synchrotron techniques can be very useful for the cultural heritage studies. So Patrick Bruno is asking, whether the courses on synchrotron radiation and like X-ray techniques uh, are commonly taught in the departments of uh, that deal with uh, art in the universities. So is it something common that uh, you can have or it's rare? I'm not familiar enough with all the university uh, courses, but what I observed is uh, the organization of, of summer schools, for example, uh, at different places uh, and the organization of workshop conferences. So 
indeed the training the museum or art historian community is very important so that they know that they have at their disposal techniques which can help them get, getting more information about uh, the, the collections they are in charge of uh, but uh, yeah this is something which is uh, increasing more and more ah you are mute Kirill. okay yeah, uh, and then again, uh, there and back again to the radiation damage. So uh, John Twiley is uh, interested whether the temporal structure of the beam uh, can play a role in the reducing of beam damage. So the filling modes, uh, the temporal temporal structure. Well, not really, I guess it's. Mainly, mainly the average, the average, average, average flux. That means. Yeah, I would. I mean, yeah, I think. I, I mean, at least in the experiments we are carrying, we are we are carrying out, uh, we will try to limit the flux to the minimal uh, level such that we have uh, sufficient quality in our results. The timing mode, I have no idea. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, of course. I mean, if it is with the idea to measure before the radiation, that's maybe what he has in mind, which is not something we have explored because in 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 the exp in the experiments we are carrying out, chemistry is one thing, but the beam size is another thing. So we have to combine X-ray fluorescence, X-ray spectroscopy with a micro probe. And this is not necessarily something that you are going to combine also with a time resolved experiment, but maybe there is something to explore in the, in the future. And we have also a question on uh, on YouTube. Uh, Rivan Biswas uh, would like you to comment on the applications of uh, pair distribution function based technique for the microstructural characterization of cultural heritage. So, is it uh, possible in ECRF? Is it uh, used in cultural heritage field? It has been used already. There were some, some publication. One I have in mind, I think, is from 2016 by. Uh, uh, Sophie Sersois and co-workers. And in particular, it was uh, the, the example I have in mind is to study carbon blocks and the different, uh, to get information about which kind of uh, materials were used to produce carbon black inks or car carbon black cosmetics. So this is indeed, it's not so common, but it's there are more and more applications of this technique. So there is another question about uh, the sensitivity of uh, synchrotron-based XRF uh, when it comes to the trace elements uh, analysis. Uh, this question is from my dear Z. So can, do you have a, an estimate of what uh, what what is reachable? This is true. In terms, that, I guess, of co concentration. Yeah, I mean, it, it really depends. Again, again, it will it will really depend on uh, which elements you are interested in. Uh, if uh, the beam size is uh, matters or not. If you have to work with a, a very small beam size or, or whatever, the question of uh, sensitivity is not so much. Enfin, let's say from from my experience, is usually not a problem in the field of cultural heritage because quite often. The materials we are work, we are analyzing, they are highly concentrated. It will be, for example, chrome, yellow, uh, lead, uh, chromium, uh, whatever. Uh, it's more important in fields such as environmental science, um, biology as well. And it's clear that, for example, on ID21, cultural heritage is something like 25% of our activity, but we have many other uh, activities related to the study of uh, biological systems, plants, uh, cells, tissues, and so on. It's clear that in this case, the increased flux can be indeed used to detect uh, lower concentration of metals in uh, organic uh, matrices usually. And where, where the benefits in terms of flux will be offered by the EBS will be a clear advantage. Okay, and probably the last question, so coming back to radiation damage again. So you mentioned that uh, you can have two, basically two kinds of damage, the damage that damages the sample and damage that affects your data. Yep. So Mustafa Seba is interested uh, on what effect, so what, what are the, the, the effects 
that you can have in your data that are caused by by the radiation damage. So as an end user, what what has to be careful about? So what are the signs? What what what? How how can data be damaged? So typical uh, modification of data we can observe will be, for example, photo reduction. So this phenomenon of uh, chromate reduction into chromium three. Here it is observed on two different samples, one which has been exposed uh, to UV or visible light and the other one which was kept in the dark. Uh, but similar phenomena of photoreduction can also happen under X-ray beam. So how we, are, we will notice that in, in this case, for example, will be to acquire the same spectrum uh, at, at several times on the same point. And what you see is that if there is a beam damage in this case, the intensity of the pre-edge peak will decrease, meaning that you will have a, a progressive uh, reduction of chromium-6 into chromium-3. In other cases, what we see is an amorphization. For example, by doing X-ray diffraction, you have the diffraction peaks and their intensity is going to decrease and the baseline is going to increase. So uh, we cannot generalize. I mean, the, each case is different, but the idea is to follow in time uh, the evolution of data and also to see if by reducing the, the flux, uh, you, you have an effect on the speed of this kind of reactions and so on, and how, how you can limit them and uh, no, prevent them. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Marine, again, for, for the nice presentation and for, for answering the questions. And, uh, I would like also to thank all the participants uh, for, for being with us. So here, I think at this point, we're gonna end our seminar and we will be very happy to see you again uh, next week, same time, same place, Friday at two for the seminar of uh, Professor Andrei, Andrei Petokhov about uh, self-assembly of uh, nanoparticles under synchrotron light. So thanks for being with us and uh, have a good weekend. Goodbye.